Do Aung San Suu Kyi, ladies and gentlemen, it's a historical moment. We welcome here one of the most extraordinary personalities of this century. A woman who has fought for freedom, against oppression, for justice, for the young people, for women. We are very honored that we have the privilege to listen to you this morning. It is your first visit abroad after 24 years, and you just told me it's practically exactly the day when you came last to this country 24 years ago. And of course, we know that you have spent over 15 years of the 24 years in, in house arrest. We also welcome here a personality who has been distinguished for what she has done by practically every prestigious award and particularly the Nobel Peace Prize in 1991. It's an extraordinary person also in terms of her wisdom, in terms of what she has done for the idea not to be guided by fear, but always to be guided by hope. So, Aung San Suu Kyi, we welcome you cordially here in Thailand. Please. I would like to begin by thanking Professor Schwab and all the organizers of the World Economic Forum who made it possible for me to come here. It has been a very interesting and very valuable experience for me. I've managed to connect up with people from all parts of the world, and all of them have shown a tremendous interest in what is going on in my country. So this morning, I would like to talk, uh, talk about commitment to the improvement of that piece, little piece, not so little perhaps, of the world, whom some of us call Burma and some of us call Myanmar. Commitment entails dedication, firmness of purpose, perseverance, and clear objectives. I have been asked very often what, whether I think that the reform process in Burma is irreversible. Now, when people talk about the reform process, we have to question what they mean. When I was first released from house arrest at the end of 2010, people usually meant political reform. They were aware of the fact that political prisoners were being released and uh, that uh, there were steps towards national reconciliation. And as the NLD, my party, decided to re-register and take part in the electoral process, uh, this was seen as a sign of inclusiveness. But later, as we started preparing for the elections, I noticed that the emphasis shifted to economic reform. People, when they talked about reform, meant economic reform. With regard to that, there are many different opinions. I have heard people getting very excited over the momentum of reform in Burma. At the same time, I have heard others, some of them hardened entrepreneurs, saying, reforms? What reforms? So this is why I prefer to talk about improvements in our country because reform could mean 
whatever it is that the person who is using the word may wish it to mean. But for me, reform means improvement to the condition of our people. Going back to commitment, when I'm asked this question, are the reforms in Burma irreversible? I say this depends on how committed the military is to this reform process. Now, I would like to expand this to say that our success will depend how irreversible the reform process is will depend on national commitment. There has to be commitment on the part of all of those who wish to improve the state of our country. We have to know what we want. This is why I'm so much in favor of this very simple motto, improving the state of the world. We just want to improve the state of Burma. That's what we mean when we say reform. We do not mean the kind of reforms that may benefit any particular individual or group or organization, but the kind of reforms that will mean an improvement for our peoples in general. I deliberately use the word peoples because Burma is made up of many ethnic nationalities. We all make up the union of Burma. This is why national reconciliation has been so very important for us. And now I think we should shift the emphasis from time to time from national reconciliation to national commitment. Because it is national commitment that will bring us both national reconciliation and improvements in our material conditions. I have been studying the growing volume of work on failing and failed states and how to fix them. And in all this work, I have been particularly struck by one finding put forward by Paul Collier. He mentions of that uh, it has been found that a critical mass of educated people was important, in fact, essential in order to make reform strategies work. And by that, by a critical mass of educated people, he meant a large population and a large proportion of that population with secondary education. This was what struck me, secondary education. He was not talking about PhDs. He was not talking about university graduates. A critical mass of secondary, secondary education, uh, educated people was what was necessary in order to successfully implement reform strategies. Now, this is very much in line with my way of thinking. We need basic education in Burma. I have been emphasizing this for the past month or so because I think there has so far been too much emphasis on uh, tertiary education, even on postgraduate education. And I would like to explain that by basic education, I do not mean elementary education, but the kind of education that will enable our people to earn a decent living for themselves. It's as simple as that. The proportion of young people who are unemployed in Burma is extremely high. That, I keep saying, is a time bomb. For how long can these young people keep on depending on their parents, which is what they're doing? because they have no employment. And who are the people who are going to implement these sometimes quite ambitious reform strategies? Again and again, the, these, those interested in the new openings in Burma who have visited our country in, during the past month or two have remarked on the fact that there is a grave lack of people capable of carrying out the measures that, that the government is proposing. So who are going to carry out these measures? 
how do we find the people to make, who, to, who will make sure that our reform process becomes irreversible? We need capacity, but not quite capacity in the way in which some organizations see it. We need capacity to be built from the ground upwards. And this is where I would like all of you to help. I would like you to think very seriously about how to build up a strong basic foundation for reform success in Burma. For the moment, please don't think too much in times of how much benefits investment will bring to those who are investing. I understand that investors invest because they hope to profit from the ventures. Well, we agree with that, but we also hope to benefit from these investment ventures. Our country must benefit as much as those who have come in to invest there. So please think deeply for us. I have been listening to many speakers in this forum, and I was particularly struck by one comment, very simple comment, that we have to look to the question, questions of corruption and equality, inequality. And I absolutely agree with that. We have to try to eradicate corruption and inequality as we proceed towards greater investment. We do not want more investment to mean more, more uh, possibilities for corruption. We do not want investment to mean greater inequality. We do not want corruption to mean greater privileges for the already privileged. We want investment to mean, quite simply, jobs, as many jobs as possible. It's as simple as that. Job creation is extremely important in Burma. And together with job creation must go training, the kind of training that will enable our unemployed young to take up jobs, vocational training. We need vocational training and non-formal education much more than we need doctoral programs, which is not to say that I do not value higher education. Indeed, I value it very much. But we have to look to the needs of our country in a very practical way. So I'm speaking to you as somebody who lives in a society that is in great need of basic skills that will enable all our people to take part in our reform process. We want our national commitment to become firm. Without this national commitment, we cannot go forward. National commitment, we would like to link to regional and global commitment to shared goals. We all want a more prosperous, more peaceful world. We want to be part of that more prosperous, more peaceful world. We don't want to be marginalized. We don't want to be left behind. We don't want to fall by the wayside because we've chosen the wrong path. So I'm here not to tell you what to do, but quite simply to tell you what we need. And we want you to help us to find the answers. Many countries have grappled with corruption and failed, or are failing at the moment. I hope they will succeed at some time. We have to grapple with corruption. We want to su succeed. I keep telling our people, it's true that we're behind everybody else, but that means we can learn from the mistakes of everybody else. And in that way, we will avoid making these mistakes. And, and as uh, our well-wishers keep saying, we can leapfrog and get to our goal quicker than we might otherwise have done if we had not been aware of the mistakes made by others. So in this meeting, I would very much welcome suggestions from all or any of you. I don't think all, because I suppose there won't be time for everybody to make suggestions, uh, as to how we can cope with the problems of a country 
which is yet uh, at a, still yet at a stage when we are working towards national reconciliation. You have to accept that we have not yet achieved it. So we are trying to achieve national commitment to national reconciliation and development. So please, ideas, suggestions, practical ones, and please, please think of the opportunities that Burma is offering the world as opportunities for you as well as for us. I will take any questions that Professor Schwab and all of you may wish to put to me, so, but that is all I have to say. Please help us to meet our needs, and I think you will find it a very, very worthwhile thing to have done. Thank you. Thank you. Now, if I may just come back to two words and two um, definitions you used. One was improvements. Can I ask you, uh, though, Aung San Suu Kyi, what would be the priorities which you would see for such improvements? I have to say job creation because I'm extremely worried about the high level of unemployment in my country, particularly youth unemployment. As I mentioned earlier, that's a time bomb. Many of our young people are already uh, following the wrong path. They sit around at tea shops, but what is worse, some of them sit around at toddy palm shops. And you know what toddy palm is, it's, it's, uh, it's our cheapest alcoholic drink. So, and some of them have taken to drugs, some of them have taken to gambling. If this goes on, we will not be able to reform them, let alone reform our country. So I keep saying what I'm afraid of is not so much joblessness as hopelessness. If our young people start losing hope, we will have a big problem on our hands. So job creation. If I may come back to also to the other expression you used, the national commitment, in what form would you like to see this national commitment expressed? As commitment to national goals rather than, than uh, to goals that are really for the sake of empowering any particular group or organization. I think we need to empower our people. This is one of our first national goals. Without the empowerment of the people, it's no use talking about democracy. We can talk about democracy, democratic reforms, but if we don't empower our people, if we work to increase their dependency on the powers that be, then we will not achieve our democratic goals. An empowerment of people, of course, requires what you emphasize so much, education, training, a building of uh, capabilities. Um, as far as the system inside which those empowered people should evolve, uh, how would you see the system? The, the political system particularly. At the present? Yeah. Now, the political system at present is one which is supposed to be democratic. But I cannot say that we have really achieved all the necessary basics of a genuine democratic society. But I would like to take up what you said earlier about how to empower people. Mm -hmm. Just by giving an example of how I am trying to empower the people in my constituency. It's very simple. We let the people decide for themselves as far as possible how they can improve their lives and how they will go about that. For example, we started with a very small project. Uh, we had a raffle on New Year's Day, Burmese New Year's Day, which was on the 17th of April, uh, cash prizes for three villages. And uh, the winning villages were asked to choose what they wished to do with the money for the community. And uh, we, would, we provided them with technical advice, with legal advice. 
but it was up to them to decide for themselves how they wish to spend them, their money to help the community, to improve the conditions in their, improve conditions in their community. And it was amazing how quickly they understood what was expected of them. When they were told that they could decide, but it had to be by consensus, everybody in the village would be allowed to take part in the discussions, while well, children could sit in, even if they couldn't understand what was going on. And we made it quite clear that we would make no distinction between members of the NLD and members of other political parties. All villagers had to take part in the decisions. It, uh, it worked amazingly well. We, ha uh, the, we won the elections two months ago. And these, in these two short months, I think some of our constituents are beginning to learn what it means to be members of a democratic society. So, Aung San Suu Kyi, you emphasized already, and this is a deep belief also of the World Economic Forum, that business has not only to contribute to economic development, but also to social progress. Now, in Davos, in your, uh, we were very fortunate that you addressed us already three months after you have been released from house arrest in 2010, so you, you had a communication in 2011, and this year, in your video message, you said um, that economic progress is dependent on more than just fiscal and monetary measures, need to be upheld by judicial and legislative reforms to ensure that sound regulations and laws are administered justly and effectively. Now, I, I, I take this statement and enlarge it a little bit. Um, how do you see the evolution of the juridical uh, framework in your country. You're setting me off on my favorite subject. I'm afraid I'm going to be a terrible bore. <laughs> uh, I've always insisted that rule of law was the most, uh, most important issue. And uh, we've had to try to make people understand in Burma, I think in Burma rather than elsewhere, that by rule of law, we did not mean new laws. And by rule of law, we did not simply mean laws aimed at protecting the rights of political activists. Some people in Burma think that's what we're talking about when we talk about the rule of law. So I have to insist, ad nauseum actually, that there are many good laws already existing in Burma, but we do not have a clean and independent judicial system. And unless we have such a system, it is no use having the best laws in the world. So would-be investors in Burma, please be warned. Even the best investment law would be of no use whatsoever if there are no courts that are clean enough and independent enough to be able to administer those laws justly. This is our problem. And so far, we have not been aware of any reforms on the judicial front. We keep saying we need judicial reforms, but I have to confess that not many in the government seem to agree with this. They do not seem to think that there's a need for judicial reform, or perhaps they don't think there's an urgent need for judicial reform. But I consider the need to be very urgent indeed. Let us start with rule of law before we start uh, studying what the new investment law is about. Now I would come back to this um, uh, world of national reconciliation. Um, Burma, Myanmar, has a very ethnically diverse uh, population with very distinct cultures. How can you bridge those differences and achieve national unity and commitment? It's mutual respect, because mutual respect engenders mutual trust. And I say that this from experience. This is not a dream. For the last two decades, we have been upheld by the strong uh, support of ethnic nationality political parties. They are the organizations which have stood most firmly by us. Whenever we were going through difficult times, our ethnic nationality allies were always with us. So 
I can say from personal experience that it is possible not only to bridge our differences, but to build up a strong foundation of trust. We trust one another. When we were in trouble, we looked to the ethnic nationality parties to be by our side. I'll have to be quite open and say not to other Burmese, ethnic, ethnic Burmese-based political parties, but to ethnic nationality political parties. So it works. We can learn to work together to trust one another. The, the gap is nothing like unbridgeable. Billions of people have been on your side when you were confined to house arrest. Now you are the official chairman of the National League for Democracy, the opposition leader. What would you expect from the world to support you? And I have to add, to support the uh, reconciliation process, not only as far as different people are concerned, but also politically in your country. How can we deal with the two sides, if I may ask you, well, we to need make a, sure to yes. make what we are doing today, but uh, to make sure that um, the country goes into the direction of democracy, reconciliation, peace, and uh, strong economic development? We need a balanced approach. We would like the world to look at how much progress there has been on the political front, as well as on the economic front. I would not like you to be over-optimistic. I think optimism is good, but cautious optimism. These days, I'm coming across a, a lot of what I would call reckless optimism. That is not going to help you. It's not going to help us. So we need a balanced report. A little bit of healthy skepticism, I think, is in order. <laughs> Now, Burma, Myanmar will have uh, the presidency of the ASEAN countries in 2014. So that's in some way a benchmark. What would you see to be concretely achieved by 2014? And how should the ASEAN partners uh, reflect on what they would like to have achieved by 2014? What will be achieved by 2014 will depend to a certain extent on the other ASEAN nations. You must know what you want Burma to achieve, and you must let Burma know what you want it to achieve. I believe in working for whatever we want. I don't believe in handouts. So ASEAN should not engage in handouts. You must demand from Burma as well. You must tell them what you expect for them from them. You must tell them what you expect from the future chair of ASEAN. I think that is very much in order. We must all learn that we don't get anything for nothing. And this is a very simple basic lesson that I keep repeating to our people. We don't get anything for nothing. And there is no use in hoping unless you engage in genuine endeavor. No endeavor, no hope. That is a very simple formula. And I think ASEAN must, <laughs> ASEAN must insist on this. ASEAN must let Burma know what you expect from its chair of 2014. Madam, may I ask you a personal question? We are coming to the end of this session. What went through your thinking when you stepped down from the plane after 24 years and one month abroad? Well, let me tell you what went on in my mind before I stepped down from the plane. <laughs> because uh, the captain was so very kind as to invite me to sit in the cockpit as we were making the landing, so I would have a good view of Bangkok spread out in its nighttime glory. And uh, sitting in the cockpit, I looked at this very, very complicated control panel, very high tech. And it struck me that 30 years ago, I would have been, my attention would have been riveted on that control panel. It would not have been engaged by all the lights below because I've landed in New York, I've landed in, in, in London. In those past years, I'd seen, well, brighter lights than I saw that evening. But this time, I was 
completely fascinated by the lights because I had just left a Burma suffering from electricity cuts. I'd left Burma, when I left Burma three days ago, there were demonstrations, candlelight demonstrations going on all over the country, protests against electricity cuts uh, that were, had been plaguing us for a month or so. And I thought, 30 years ago, the scene that met my eyes uh, on landing in Bangkok would not have been very different from what would have met my eyes on landing in Rangoon. But now the difference is considerable. And this is what went through my mind. I, I, I have to say very frankly that what went through my mind was we need an energy policy. <laughs> <laughs> Now, may I add, uh, before we conclude, another personal question. You had the admiration of the world because you showed so much strength during those many years of struggle. What gave you the strength? I was asked a question similar to this by young shapers, and I said DNA had a lot to do with it. But I think uh, I should have mentioned something equally important. It was my mother who taught me to be disciplined and to put duty above everything else. She did this not just by teaching me how important duty was, but by acting out her belief in the primacy of duty. Because she taught me that duty mattered more than anything else in life. I don't know whether all of you agree with me or not, and of course then we can argue about what is meant by duty. It uh, became second nature for me to try to discharge my duty as far as I was capable. I can't say I've always been good in the sense of, I can't say that I've always put duty before everything else, but I have tried. We are coming to the end of this session, and um, Burma is blessed not only with natural resources, but with great human resources, as we just experienced uh, over the last half an hour. Thank you so much for giving us the privilege to participate in this historical meeting, and I can certainly speak on behalf of all the participants if I say you have also in the future in a very difficult situation, it will be difficult, uh, um, but uh, I think we all can be hopeful. You have all our support. We want to contribute to a Burma which corresponds to your objectives, peaceful, just, great engagement and empowerment of people, and particularly also a country with an engaged, young, and capable, and well-trained young population. So thank you again, Do Aung San Suu Kyi, to be with us this morning. We wish you all the best. Thank you.